A very good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee. There are no apologies this morning. And our main item of business today is our final evidence session on the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic Articles Scotland Bill. And I refer members to papers one and two. And I'm very pleased to welcome to today's meeting Ash Reagan, Minister for Community Safety, Eleanor Findlay, Bill Team Leader, David Bell, Pyrotechnics Policy Lead, and Natalie Stewart, Solicitor with the Legal Directorate of the Scottish Government. And uh, Ms Stewart will be joining us remotely. So we very much appreciate the time that you're taking to join us this morning. And I now invite the Minister to make some brief opening remarks. Minister. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the committee. So in 2019, I launched a public consultation following incidents over the bonfire season uh, in previous years. And there was an overwhelming response to that. So we had over 16,000 responses. Analytical work was also undertaken, and that was including an opinion poll to provide views that were representative of adults in Scotland. And a strong message emerged from this, that the status quo is not an option. People clearly wanted change, and they wanted to see tighter controls on the sale and on the use of fireworks in Scotland. The representative opinion poll, for example, shows that the majority of adults in Scotland felt that there should be more controls over the sale of fireworks at 71% and over their use at 68%. And contributing factors included the misuse of fireworks, but also the wider harm, noise and disturbance that fireworks can cause. People do see a place, however, for well-organised fireworks displays, but the unpredictable use of fireworks by members of the public was identified as a problem. So I established the Independent Firework Review Group to consider all the evidence available and uh, the legislative options for change. And the group reached a majority consensus that a fundamental change is required in how fireworks are accessed and used by the public. The misuse of pyrotechnics is a growing problem too, which can cause injury, distress and alarm, and also damage to property. And while we're not aware of any fatalities due to pyrotechnic misuse in Scotland, we have seen some severe injuries. And there have been fatalities in other countries, and I want to do all I can to prevent fatalities or further injuries from happening in Scotland. So in response to the significant concerns raised, the Scottish Government hosted a series of discussions with stakeholders to look at what more could be done. And as a result, I made the decision to consult more widely on the misuse of pyrotechnics as part of the broader 2021 consultation. And results of that consultation showed a majority of those who responded to it agreed with each of the provisions included in the bill. For example, 84% agreed that a fireworks licensing system should be introduced and 83% agreed with the introduction of the no firework areas. So the bill has five key policies. So first, a firework licensing system, which requires the public to apply for a license to purchase, acquire, possess and use F2 and F3 fireworks. Secondly, restrictions on the days that fireworks can be supplied to and used by the public. And they align uh, broadly with existing traditional firework periods. And thirdly, firework control zones, which provide local authorities with the power to designate areas where it's not permitted for the public to use fireworks to enable communities to have a much greater say in how fireworks are used in their local area. And fourthly, a proxy purchase and supply offence to ensure that adults who supply fireworks or pyrotechnic articles to children under any circumstances can be held accountable. Uh, and also an offence of being in possession of a pyrotechnic without reasonable excuse while travelling to in the immediate vicinity of or attending either a designated sporting or music venue or event or a public procession or public assembly. So I'm aware that certain legislation was introduced in the UK to ban certain types of fireworks such as bangers and this has been successful uh, and I think that was highlighted by the fireworks industry. And so it's clear that legislation can have a positive and direct impact in uh, reducing harm. So to conclude, convener, I think uh, these issues are complex, but I think the bill strikes a proportionate balance between introducing the necessary restrictions, ensuring robust checks and balances are in place to mitigate against unintended consequences, while fully utilising the powers of this parliament to reduce harms and help us to protect our communities. 
Th thank you very much, Minister. Um, so we'll now just move directly on to questions. And as ever, if I can ask uh, members to make their questions uh, as succinct uh, as possible. And if I may, I'll just maybe open up with a, a general uh, a question uh, for you, Minister. So obviously one of the, as you outlined, one of the policy objectives of the bill is to support almost a cultural shift in uh, in uh, how fireworks and pyrotechnics are used, almost changing our relationship with them. So I just wonder if you can uh, explain in kind of quite broad terms how you sort of env envisage that cultural change being uh, brought about through the provisions of the bill that we're discussing today. Mm. Thanks, Convener. Yes, I think cultural shift is how I, I've described um, what we're trying to do here, I think, when I launched the, the action plan. So obviously we do have, we've got a really long-standing relationship with fireworks in this country, you know, and lots of people are used to using them and going to organise displays. So I think that, you know, changing the, the culture around how, um, you know, they're sold, how they're used, I don't think we're going to uh, achieve that sort of change overnight. I think this is something that's, that's going to take some time. So I set out the action plan. So that was, um, that was published in 2019. Uh, and that was with a view to sort of begin to take the steps to change the culture. Um, and that included, you know, there was a range of actions that were included in that. And um, it was things like, um, so awareness raising, uh, communication, I think working with local communities, because we know some local communities are, are much more affected than others. Uh, so I guess... I would sum that up, that this was a range of actions that were not just legislative change, there were non-legislative actions as well. And the bill that's in, in front of the committee now is the kind of final stage, if you like, in that part of the process. Um, and, you know, it's this sort of key package of actions. And the bill, you know, brings into fruition the sort of final recommendations that the fireworks re review group had for how we go about changing this culture and i think the you know the main thing that i'm trying to do with this is you know protect public safety you know enhance all of our well-being i think there's a good is a good way to think of it by ensuring that you know pirate techniques that fireworks that don't cause harm serious distress um, and injury and so the legislative part sits alongside the non-legislative actions that we're taking as well and the provisions in the bill are designed to support that that change in how we use fireworks so i think the best way to describe it is that instead of fireworks being something that you could you know go into a shop and sort of spontaneously buy and use it's it's moving that forward into um, something that isn't spontaneous, it would have to be a planned purchase that had been, been thought through and planned and thought about in advance. And so, um, and so that, I think that's the, the right way that we go forward. And I think that should result in a, in a culture change over time. Thanks very much, uh, Minister. So I'm just going to um, hand over uh, to uh, Russell Finlay to pick up some other questions. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, now, we note that the bill establishes penalties of up to uh, six months imprisonment for some of the offences. Yet the Scottish Government have extended the presumption against short sentences up to 12 months. I'm just wondering whether there's a possible kind of inconsistency in that respect and just trying to understand how this particular proposed sentence was arrived at. Um, OK, so... I think the starting point for how we uh, sort of considered the, the, the penalties that were in place is we looked at the ones that were in place under the existing um, fireworks legislation. So, so that sort of sets out, um, I'm sure the committee will know this, but that sets out uh, imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months and a fine not exceeding level five on the standard scale or both. So, you know, when we were looking at this in detail, there didn't seem to be any suggestion that the, the current level that the penalties were set at um, were not set at an appropriate level. And I think in terms of the presumption against short sentences, you know, the committee will be well aware of this, that it is a presumption, it's not a ban. And so, you know, that means that in any, you know, given case, the court is able to decide on what is appropriate depending on the circumstances and the particulars of the case. Um, I think, you know, there is some interest in, 
you know, I'm sure that, that it's, it's come up in front of the committee already, you know, whether having stronger or more harsh penalties, you know, would, would that have more of an effect? Would that act as more of a deterrent? I, I don't think I've seen any compelling evidence to suggest that would be the case. Okay. Um, we've also heard evidence, or rather a lack of evidence, about the numbers of cases which are prosecuted currently. Okay. Um, I think we've struggled to get that information. And indeed, the Fireworks Industry Association witness expressed similar frustrations about trying to ascertain how much lawbreaking and prosecution around that there already is. So the question is, how can we establish that? Mm. And if, if indeed this is, the suspicion might be these prosecu prosecutions aren't being, the law isn't being used to its fullest extent just now, why add to that mm -hmm. if there's a risk that that won't then be enforced fully also? Mm -hmm. So we did do a review of the evidence and we did publish um, a lot of the information that I think Russell Finlay is, is talking about there. So I'll ask Eleanor to come in in a moment and give a little bit more detail on that. But uh, I mean, there is a lot of enforcement activity that goes on um, specifically um, in the run up to, to Bonfire Night, which we know is you know, it's the busiest time of the year for the emergency services. So there's an immense amount of work that goes on um, from the emergency services in preventative work um, and also our partners as well. But I think, you know, we all recognise that once, you know, the fireworks have got into the, to the wrong hands, then potentially that's something that we need to look at there. But I'm quite clear that there's a lot of enforcement activity that is already undertaken. So I'll ask um, Eleanor. Um, who's no doubt had time to find that information now to, to give us a bit more detail on that. Yes, certainly. So um, data covering the last 10 years, so that would be from 2010, 2011 through to 2019, 2020, shows that nearly 300 people, so 297, were either proceeded against in court or given a, a non-court disposal um, for a firework-related offence. Um, so data from the Crown Office was published um, in a kind of wider evidence review um, alongside the, the consultation analysis from the first um, consultation in 2019. So that was published as a package of reports in, in October 2019. And I can certainly share that with the committee if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think so. It'd be quite probably useful to know what the geographical breakdown, the um, date of these offences, presumably they are centred around fireworks night, but it'd be good to see that. And um, I don't know if the data includes the age of the offenders and the outcomes. So I don't have all of that data in front of me at the moment. No. What I can tell you is the average um, age of conviction um, would be 22 years, and it tends to be men, um, so 22-year-old males, but I don't have the geographical um, data in front of me at the moment. OK, thank you. I won't take up Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to bring in Katie Clark now. I think Katie's got some questions uh, still on the issue of prosecution, uh, and then we'll move on to some questions around licensing. Uh, Katie Clark? Thank you. Um, yes. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I suppose the first thing I was going to say that um, isn't so much about prosecution um, is, you know, really, maybe if you could explain why you think this is emergency legislation, given that, apart from the proxy purchase, most provisions won't be in place for November, and it's a very complicated system that's being proposed. So some witnesses have questioned whether the bill's actually necessary, given that there's already UK legislation which makes it illegal to supply fireworks to those under 18, as well as prohibiting the use of fireworks in a public place. So given what you've said to um, Russell in relation to prosecutions and, and we do we would like more information on that because it, we've not had that evidence about how the current legislation is being used. Could you maybe explain why existing le legislation not be used or amended or more action taken under existing uh, legislation and outline what consideration was given to those kind of approaches other than the int introduction of this primary or indeed emergency legislation? So there are well-established processes that are in place to enforce the existing regulations. But I'll, I'll come back to my previous point, that this legislation is an attempt to, to change the way that we 
primarily, I suppose, buy fireworks, but to a lesser extent also use them. Um, because once, as I said, there's an immense amount of work goes into preparing for the run-up to, to Bonfire Night, which I think as well, you may have already heard, you know, it's not just a night anymore. It, it's turned into like a season. Um, so it's kind of uh, spreading out over a, a longer period. Um, so once the fireworks have got into the hands of people that are int intent on misusing them, we've, we've now got a much bigger challenge um, in terms of how we deal with that. So the legislation that's in front of you is an attempt to address, to go some way to address that. And I think, you know, in terms of enforcement as well, once we see uh, a change in, you know, the way that we use fireworks, a change in this sort of culture of use of fireworks, then I think that over time, I think that that would have an effect on, or an impact on, I think, enforcement as well. So um, there was quite a few questions in, in Katie Clark's um, question to me there, so I'll try and, and, and cover it. So if I don't get it all, can, can um, come back to me, Ms Clark, if I don't cover it all. But I think you, you were asking about, um, you know, existing legislation and about, uh, particularly about um, the under-18s, is that right? So I think that, yes, there is UK legislation on that already. So at the moment, it's illegal to... Um, supply fireworks to those under 18 on a commercial basis. But I think, I don't know if the committee's heard this, but it, we've heard significant anecdotal evidence that, um, you know, I think parents, but certainly adults, are, are purchasing fireworks and they're then, you know, they're then, you know, giving, supplying them to, to children. So that's, that was where the sort of proxy purchasing offence um, was was developed in order to sort of close close that loophole, if you like. So, you know, children won't be criminalised at all at, at that, but this is an attempt to obviously hold those those adults to account on that. Um, and also, I think that that does ensure that, you know, we are limiting, you know, where fireworks potentially are ending up because, you know, basically these are explosive devices and we, we want to be careful about, about, you know, who's being able to use them. Um, and I think the measures in this bill also, it, it just gives us uh, the opportunity, if you like, to intervene at that earlier stage. So we can intervene at an earlier stage and we can then prevent some of the issues that, you know, many of us will see in our constituencies fr from going on um, to happen. So, um, Eleanor, have you got any more that you'd like to add on that point? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, other than just to say, um, you know, alternative, legis alternative legislative solutions um, were obviously considered um, as, as, as the bill was being developed and as the policy was being developed, and, and those are outlined in, in the policy memorandum. And, and in particular, the Fireworks Review Group considered um, alternative legislative solutions as part of their options appraisal approach. And, and as I say, that, that's outlined in the policy memorandum, so there's some further detail in there. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you want to come back in? Yes, I, mean, I think the Minister has been very clear on the issue of proxy purchase. And I think, I mean, I personally, you know, can quite see the, the case that she's making there. Um, did you look, uh, and, you know, her, she personally, or, or ministers look, at the way that current legislation was being used? Because there is mm -hmm. concerns being raised by the committee that the resources aren't being put in by police, by prosecutors, to actually pursue cases which are illegal at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've been asked to, to look at is, a, is quite a complicated system that we're looking at on a you know, truncated basis, given that it's emergency legislation. It's and not emergency we're, legislation. We're, it's not clear that the current legislation is being properly enforced. And really, it's a question for the, the politicians and effort for the minister in terms of whether they really looked at this and got reported you know, the, 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 the levels of offence and took a view as to whether the, you know, the amount of effort was being put in that should be at the moment to prosecute under existing legislation. Is that something perhaps the Minister could give a view on? Yes, uh, so it's not emergency legislation. I don't think um, that's right for the member to characterise it in that way. It is a, a slightly speeded up timetable, I will admit to that, but it, it certainly wouldn't come under the category of emergency legislation. Um, I think we've already covered some of the, the um, 
information in regard to so the, the prosecution data in my answer and, um, and Eleanor Finlay's answer to Russell Finlay. So we'll certainly be able, if the committee haven't seen that data that was part of the evidence review in 2019, uh, we can, you know, if the committee are unable to, to get hold of that, we can certainly, and I think we've already committed to, to sending that over. So that does show that enforcement uh, you know, is already taking place. Uh, and I would reiterate my previous answer that, you know, Scotland spends, you know, an immense amount of resources. I'm sure if you've spoken to the police or the fire service, they will, they will, um, they will tell you this themselves. An immense amount of resources and also local government to, in, in preparing um, for Bonfire Night and to get people to adhere to the current regulations. Um, my view is that that's why I think we need to go further with the um, stricter controls that we have now, because I think at the moment that is disproportionate, um, the amount of effort that we're expending on that for what is, you know, a few days of the year and the impact that it's having on the people of Scotland, you know, and the fact that they've, you know, the people of Scotland have told us that they, they want to see change in this area. And I, I would accept that, that some of this is, it's a little bit more complicated than perhaps um, we might have wanted it to be if Scotland was an independent country. Um, we would be able to do things probably in a slightly different way. But we have had various complicating factors um, in the way that we've had to um, produce the legislation for, for reasons that I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll, we may touch upon those later. But certainly when we were looking at developing the legislation, of course we looked at you know, the existing legislation that, that was around in this area and evaluated how it was being used. And also the review group um, that obviously had all the stakeholders on it, including the fireworks industry, that they were tasked specifically with looking at the, the current regime and looking to see if there were gaps in the law and looking to see, uh, you know, internationally uh, other regimes to see if there was something that they could come up with that would help us to change the culture around how we use fireworks in Scotland. And obviously they, they put them into recommendations to myself, which and this legislation is part of um, my work in taking forward those recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, if that's all from Katie, then I'm just going to bring in Jamie Green uh, for a follow-up question, and then we'll move on to licensing. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, uh, and good morning uh, to our guests today. Um, so I, I, I would like to dig a little bit deeper into the statistics and the numbers. Um, I guess what we're trying to grapple with as a committee is what is the scale of the problem and whether or not the legislation as proposed is both fit for purpose but is filling the gaps that meets the policy intention of the premise of the legislation. So some of the data that I've, I've heard today is, is new, A, news to some of us, um, but it's also three years out of date. You said it was from the 2019... Uh, what was the description of it? The 2019 evidence review. The evidence review. So this is 2022, mm -hmm. and we're creating new legislation. So what I'd really like to know is, in terms of relativity, is how many offences occur each year, and that can be an average or a total over 10 years or whatever you've got available to you. How that converts into prosecutions, and what is the outcome of those prosecutions? And what I mean specifically is that how many of those are non-court outcomes and how many of them proceed to court and are prosecuted and of those that do proceed to prosecution what sort of penalties are given because we know that existing legislation the 19 uh, the 1875 explosives act fireworks regulations 2004 and so on we, we know what existing legislation is and does and we know what the maximum penalties are and i'm keen to understand whether those maximum penalties are actually being utilised as it is under existing legislation before we start introducing new legislation. OK. I do feel we have already answered that question. I think that's very similar to the question that Russell Finlay just asked about enforcement and about the statistics. In fact, Eleanor has already read out those statistics. And we've said that we... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I didn't take them down, but I specifically asked them in that order because it does give you an idea of the scale of the problem properly. Okay. Well, the other thing I would say is it's the scale of the... Sorry, Ellen, I didn't mean to cut across you there. Is that the scale of the problem is not just limited to, um, you know, enforcement and the, the number of people that would, would end up in prison. That is, you know, for, I think for people in Scotland, that is not how they would characterise the scale of the problem. So I, I think... So what is the scale of the problem? Sorry, this is what I'm trying to get to. How many offences are reported to the police or local authorities per year? How many of them convert into some form of 
judicial action, whether that's a prosecution settled out of court or taken to court, and what is the outcome of those prosecutions in terms of using the existing maximum penalties that are available to you, are they being used to their full extent? That's the scale well, that I'm trying to get I'll, to. I'll let Eleanor come in in a moment and, and give that information again. Um, we have already given that information. That information has been um, freely available and was published by the government um, several years ago, now, and then. we said that we will share it with the committee. Um, Eleanor? This is our last evidence session. That's why I'm pushing you. Sorry. Apologies. It's so I'll, I'll just come in just to uh, I'll just read out some of the bullets here. So um, what I had mentioned before was between 2010 and 2011 and 2019, 2020, which represents the the last um, available data that we have. There were um, just under 300 people, so 297, either proceeded against in court or given um, a non-court disposal for a firework-related offence. Um, over the last six years, so 2016, 17 through to 2020, 21, the most common firework related charges relate to throwing, casting or firing a firework in a public place. So basically letting off a firework in the street, um, under 18 possession of an adult firework and, and use of an adult firework at night. So that would be outside of, of the permitted um, days um, in terms of convictions. Um, the average age of those who are convicted is 22 years, and they tend to be male. So of the 297, what percentage of those were given a non-court disposal versus those that were prosecuted more harshly? Right. Or numbers? And, and of those that, and those that were prosecuted in courts, what sort of penalties were given to them? Because we know, we know what's available to the courts. So I'm get, trying to get a feel for whether we're using the powers that we have to their full extent. So the, the, two, the two routes would be people proceeded against in court or people being given a non-court disposal. So non-court disposal would be the majority of cases that are there, and that would include issues such as um, a fiscal fine, a fiscal warning, um, a police restorative justice warning, a police recorded warning, or a police formal um, adult warning. OK, thank you. So the question, Minister, really is that over the last 10 years, <coughs> You're looking at, on average, and it's just an average, I'm sure there are peaks and troughs in this, around 30 people are prosecuted, of which the majority are non-court disposals. Knowing against the backdrop that a quarter of a million people buy fireworks each year, that's a relatively no num low number. I still don't understand the correlation between how many incidents are reported to the authorities versus how many actually proceed to prosecution. Do you, do you understand why people, some people feel that this is absolute overkill in terms of what, what you're trying to achieve, that we're simply not using the existing powers that the judiciary has to prosecute those who are breaking law, quite robust laws, some of the most robust laws uh, in Europe in terms of fireworks, that they're simply not seeing that convert into the sort of prosecutions that may act as the sort of deterrent that you want. Therefore, why the need for new powers? Well, I think I've already answered this question, and I think I've been quite clear about it as well. Um, in terms of proceedings, obviously that's up to our independent court service about how they, they choose to take things forward. And, uh, you know, we can obviously give that information to the committee. But I think if we come back to the point that I was trying to make earlier, is that when we talk about the scale of the problem, I'm not sure that that is, it, it's reflected in the way that Jamie Green's trying to characterise it there. And so some of the evidence um, that the review group and the government also looked at is things like, you know, emergency services, um, incident data, so that's the volume of firework-related incidents that are re reported to the police. Um, attacks on emergency service workers, which tells us there's a spike on attacks on fire crews over the bonfire period. And I know this is something that Jamie Green has personal interest in, and I'm sure um, would be very keen to see an improvement on those figures. And 40% of those acts of violence happen around the bonfire night period. So, um, so that's obviously a piece of evidence that we should be, I'm sure Graham oh, Green sure. would say, yeah. we'd be taking that very seriously. Um, another one is NHS um, injury data. Um, that has um, increased, and that's, so that's um, you know, firework-related diagnosis. Um, I will say, because if I don't, my officials will get very cross with me, we do have to be a bit cautious about that data, but broadly it is telling us that, that, um, that this has increased fairly consistently over the last 10 years. Uh, and the final one is obviously the one about lived experience. And we know that that was reflected very strongly um, in the consultations, in, well, I think all the consultations that the government's done, and I'm sure uh, 
that ha will have been reflected back to the committee. Uh, you know, people's powerful testimonies about the you know, significant impact that misuse, but also legitimate use as well, um, can have on them, um, can have on animals and etc. So the bill has been carefully constructed in order to re you know, reflect the, the evidence that I've, that I've just gone through here to um, also be proportionate as well, because I, you know, there's a lot of people, I think, that have said to me over the last few years, we should just ban them, you know, we should just ban fireworks. Now, in Scotland, under the devolution settle, we don't have the power to ban them, first of all. Um, so that's the a legal reason why we wouldn't have gone down that route. But also there's a policy reason here, and I think there's a, um, a kernel of what um, Jamie Green was asking there about proportionality. You know, is it proportionate? And um, I would say that it is proportionate because there's still um, uh, an obvious route for people to go through, um, albeit we're putting slightly more restrictions on it by, you know, suggesting that we set up the licensing scheme. But people are still able to, if they want to, they can still go and buy fireworks and, you know, they can still use them. So I think people have made it very clear that they want to see tighter controls on fireworks and um, in order that people can continue to use them safely. So I hope that answers Jamie Green's question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to bring in Katie Clark, who I think had not... Apologies, Katie, I don't think you'd quite finished your line of questioning. And then I'll come, uh, I'll come across to you, Pauline. Uh, Katie. Mm. Can't hear oh. you, Katie. You might be on mute. Yeah. Um, it was more that there were issues that the Minister had raised in her answers that I wanted to ask about. Um, I think she's partly ad answered it in that she said there was a constitutional problem in bringing in the legislation that perhaps she would want to bring in. I think she said that she thinks there's problems in relation to um, banning fireworks. So it would be good to get more information on that. But the complicated part of the legislation as I see it is the licensing scheme. So my main question is really whether she thinks that there's any um, constitutional problems in relation to the powers of the Parliament that affect that aspect of the bill, because that's the, the part of the bill that we see, or I see anyway, as complicated. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think I've, I've kind of touched on that in my answer to Jamie Green, that, you know, a lot of people um, would just like to see a ban. And I think people want that for a couple of reasons. I think they think it's quite simple, it'd be easy for everybody to understand. Um, uh, you know, we, in looking at the powers that are available to the Scottish Parliament, we don't have the ability to, to do a ban in Scotland. Uh, that is not available to us under the constitutional settlement. So, um, we, you know, we've looked at what was available to us and uh, we have used the maximum amount of powers of the Scottish Parliament in, in order to, to put this system into place because I wanted to reflect the Scottish public's um, desire to see those tighter con controls on fireworks. So... Um, as like I was saying earlier, there's, there's a legal reason not to do the ban, but I think there's also a strong policy reason not to do the ban. Um, you know, I personally really enjoy going to organise fireworks displays, as I'm sure many people do. I know lots of people um, use fireworks responsibly and uh, I'm sure want to be able to continue to do so. And I thought that was important. And I thought that also that reflects this debate we're having about proportionality as well, that, you know, we don't... Uh, we're not being seen to sort of punish people who are, who are using fireworks in a responsible way. We want people to be able to continue to do that if that's what they want to do. Um, so I think uh, that what we've come up with here is an attempt to, um, you know, change the way that, we, that we're using fireworks, to respond to what the public asked us to do, look at the evidence and use um, as much of the powers that we have available to us as the Scottish Parliament in, in order to make that happen. Um, could perhaps you share something in writing with the committee or bring in officials in relation to why you think yeah, a ban would be illegal at the moment or wouldn't be within the powers of the Parliament. Maybe that's something you could share with the committee. Um, but also on the on the issue of the, the um, tr truncated basis of the bill, I mean, definitely the committee has been asked to look at the bill um, in, uh, in a way that would mean that we wouldn't have as much time to look at the legislation. And we do, I mean, well, I anyway, believe that the, the licensing part of the legislation is quite complicated. So also perhaps if you could explain why it is that, we, that we're, you know, that at this stage, um, given, you know, that the committee is already looking at it and it has that view, you feel the legislation has to be on the statute book by November, given that it's not going to be put in force this year. 
Okay, well, some parts of it will be in force this year, we're hoping. So, again, this is my attempt to reflect what I saw as the, the will of the Parliament um, in, in the last session, where I gave an update to Parliament on the action plan. I think it was two consecutive years that I gave a statement to Parliament um, on, on what we were planning to do and the legislation we were bringing in. And, of course, the committee will be aware that I um, brought in um, some... Uh, we realised we were able to do some of it by secondary legislation, so we did that last year. So it's an attempt to, to keep up the, the pace of change and to keep moving forward and to keep um, working towards creating this new regime. And um, so I felt that it came across quite strongly that the will of the Parliament was that we wanted to work on this as quickly as possible. And so I'm very grateful that the, the committee um, has, uh, you know, has, has seen that they, th they also think that that's, that's important to do. Um, the sooner that this can, can go through Parliament, if Parliament uh, agrees to it, that will obviously give us as much time as possible to, tr to start working on the uh, um, implementation and enforcement of the, of the parts of the bill. Um, and I'll ask um, Natalie, if uh, she's appearing remotely, if she wants to uh, speak to Ms Clark, the earlier part of her question about the, the constitutional angle. Yes, thank you. Um, without going into too much detail, but a ban would, have a, would appear to have an, an inevitable link to product safety, and product safety is a reserved matter in terms of the Scotland Act 1998. And having a link to product safety could ha be a problem, and there could also be a disproportionate effect on individual rights if there was a ban. Thank you. Okay, th th thanks very much. I'm quite keen to move questions on because I've got a few other themes to, to cover. So I'm going to uh, bring in Pauline uh, McNeill, and then I'd like to move on to uh, questions around licensing. Yeah, Pauline. before I, I wanted a quick supplementary mm -hmm. on the, yeah. the data, if that's okay. Um, good morning. Um, I think what you've heard is that the committee are quite keen to pursue the issue of the data. And the reason for this is that I presume that you would agree that the culture change you talk about is for the general public, but we've got people who are committing antisocial behaviour, using fireworks as weapons, mm -hmm. and there needs to be some scrutiny that we are using the existing powers to act against those mm -hmm. who clearly will not be applying for licences. I hope we would agree on that point because you wouldn't be committing antisocial behaviour uh, and, and I used the example of Pollock Shields, which is what I want to ask Eileen about, if it's OK. Now, I have been involved with the Pollock Shields community because I'm a yeah. Glasgow regional uh, MSP. Yeah. There's no action was taken in Pollock Shields, and that's the evidence we've also had from the industry as well. Mm. I have tried to get to the bottom of this from the Crown Office. I have failed to do so. So what I would ask um, Eileen, um, are you aware... Pollock Shields is one of the communities all over this. Fireworks being thrown at um, emergency services, mm -hmm. dangerously used. It's a serious question, I think, is that for the Crown, is the, why, why, why are we not getting prosecutions? And, and I would suggest if we can't see this information, if it doesn't exist or if this is not happening, then there's a real danger that we might miss the target. So my first question is, are you aware that there were no prosecutions in Pollock Shields? And could you, and could you pursue the Crown? Well, I certainly will, further to this. But it might be helpful if you could also ask, mm -hmm. if they're taking this, if, if your evidence that you've gave to Jimmy Green is correct, that it's being taken seriously, mm -hmm. then they need to answer that question. Would you agree? Yes, I, I do agree with that. But I think, you know, Pauline Meenil's question about you know, people that are using them antisocially, you know, they're not going to apply for a licence. Before, they probably would just go into the shop and buy the fireworks, or we have anecdotal evidence to say that perhaps adults were buying them for them and giving them to them if they were under the age of 18. And certainly, um, I was in Pollock Shields myself um, with a group um, of boys mm -hmm. who I think were around... I think they were between the age of sort of 15 and 17 who had been involved in antisocial behaviour involving fireworks. And I kind of sat with them um, while they were going through. I can't remember, but it was a, a programme that has been run specifically in the area um, with people that had been involved antisocially with fireworks about, you know, safety and how to use them appropriately and what the law was and all this sort of thing. But, you know, what we're hoping is that when we change the legislation, that those 
um, you know, if they're 18, they won't be able to go just go into the shops and buy fireworks. So that, and they're, hopefully their parents will understand that they're not allowed to buy them and, and give them to them if they're under the age of 18. So I think that that sort of spontaneous kind of purchasing of fireworks and just going off and using them antisocially, I'm hoping with this legislation will bring those numbers right down. So yeah. I know there has been a lot of work done in Pollock Shields because um, I've, you know, I've personally seen some of it myself. I, can, I can't remember when it was that I went there. It was, it was definitely... It was probably more than two years ago, I think, because it was before um, the pandemic. But I can try and find out a little bit more information about that programme. Um, and I think that, you know, that's obviously on the non-court dis disposal side of things. And we'll see if we can get some more information from you um, from the Crown Office that would hopefully go some way to answering your question. Uh, thank you. And I do accept that. But you will be aware that there are white vans turning up in these communities selling illegal fireworks. Yep. Yeah. Um, which is what I want to come on to, which is the licensing scheme itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, my line of questioning is to really scrutinise the licensing scheme. I do support what the government are trying to achieve. I do have concerns, um, the other members have raised, about whether it might actually miss the target. So, we were given an example from the, the industry representatives last week of Northern Ireland population of 1.85 million. Mm -hmm. So there was a total of 1,500 licences issued. Sorry, um, 515 licences issued. The suggestion being that people who should be applying for licences were not. And if those figures were extrapolated to Scotland, um, then that would be something that 1,500 licences, with 250,000 fireworks being bought in Scotland, you can see the issue here. Um, I confess that trying to get my head around the legislation, I think I do now understand it. So the culture change that you're talking about would be you know, ordinary families and individuals who do um, may misuse fireworks, but they're not illegal. And that's where the concern comes from, noise disturbance, uh, animals and children with autism and so on. They need to realise so through a licensing scheme. But how confident are you? that all these families and all these people who want to set fireworks off will sit down and apply for this licence and pay the 20, 30 or £50? Pounds. Uh, I, am, I am quite confident because we see it um, with other controlled goods that people do apply for the licences. I'll ask Eleanor to come in in a minute and she can give us a bit of more um, data around um, Northern Ireland and, and so on about that. Um, and I think the, the key with this is to make it um, as simple as possible you know, not to make it too expensive uh, so that people can apply for it and, and get the licence quite quickly and easily. And to make sure that the, the awareness level is there so that people know that they have to have one. Um, so we have to do some really good work on our um, public campaigns so that we get that message out when the law changes that people that know that they have to do it. I think that, um, you know, there's often quite a lot of, um, I guess, this idea of will we change our behaviour when we change the law. And I think, you know, oh, it does feel strange. I mean, I'm young enough to remember when you know kids just sat in the back of cars and there wasn't any car seats, nobody wore a seatbelt, it wouldn't have occurred to you, you know, when I was small to get into a car and necessarily put a seatbelt on. No one would have asked you to do it. It wasn't normal. You know, obviously the law changed. And now with you know, there's obviously been really good public awareness raising campaigns with that. I can think of some of the lines in the adverts now. Um, and now you don't think twice mostly. You get in the car, you just put your seatbelt on because and that you know, people just get used to it. So I, I am confident. I, I think we all accept that you know, legislation in itself isn't going to fix all the problems. I think we, we all know that. We all know that it isn't. Um, but what we've done is, you know, through the work of the review group and, and the work that the government's done as well, we've, we've tried to find something that will go some way to addressing all of the concerns. So that's the concerns about misuse. You know, that's a lot of the concerns that people um, will no doubt have spoken to the committee about, you know, about the distress it's caused to animals, um, the distress that's felt by neurodivergent people, you know, and that's with legitimate fireworks use, but a lot of it and sporadically around them in their neighbourhoods uh, and the safety concerns about people being injured. And we've tried to do that in a balanced and proportionate way. And I've explained a little bit that, you know, it is slightly more complicated perhaps in some areas than it, it might have been able to do if we had a different um, setup. But I think I'm quite confident that we can make it as simple as possible for people to apply for it. And hopefully they will do that. And I don't want it to be a barrier to people who legitimately and safely are using fireworks. I want them to still be able to buy fireworks, you know, from their you know, local shop or whatever and be able to enjoy them with their families. 
Can I just come in on the, the Northern Ireland point? Um, so we have obviously looked at the, the system that exists in, in Northern Ireland and uh, in terms of the licensing system and have been in fairly regular um, contact with, with our counterparts there. Um, the this, this system that has been developed and is, is outlined in the bill is different from, from the system in, in Northern Ireland and is obviously unique to to, to Scotland. So just to give you an example, um, the system in Northern Ireland requires people to have a licence to purchase, possess and use fireworks, but it's aligned to every single display that they hold, whereas the system in Scotland it is intended that that will be for a longer oh, period of time and will not align to every single time that they want to go out and purchase and use fireworks on that one occasion. So it will be something that will be that people will be able to have in Scotland for kind of multiple uses of fireworks and over a longer period of time. Thank you. Um, uh, just finally, I mean, we had, I have to say, quite powerful evidence from the industry about the concerns of people don't, and I take the point that's been made that the system's different, uh, is that people will turn to the black market. I have a serious concern about we won't have any control over that, and then that obviously sparks safety concerns. Um, you probably heard the same evidence as we did. Um, what do you think of this evidence that we, we, we've heard? And do you have any concerns that people will turn to more white vans turning up in streets? Because then you don't have to get your licence. You probably just think you're setting off a few fireworks. But, yeah. you, you know, because um, then the safety checks are not there. Do you have concerns about that? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that that's part of what I was talking about earlier, about you know making sure the, the awareness raising is there, that people are very clear that what they'll be doing you know, is an offence, and also that you know, black market illegal fireworks, however you want to describe them, you know, clearly are are potentially not going to have the same kind of safety checks, and so that it's going to potentially be dangerous, and they could be injuring themselves basically by doing that. So, you know, I think there is a potential risk of of displacement of of sales, and you know, we've tried to sort of carefully consider that as the bill has be, has been developed, <coughs> and I'll ask. Um, uh, we, we did consider sort of three different, you know, we sort of considered that on a, in the sort of three different areas. And I'll ask Eleanor to speak about that in a, in a second, about those areas that we looked at. Um, but, um, you know, I'm back to the thing again where, you know, we want to see tighter controls because that's what um, the public want because of, you know, some of the evidence that we've talked about already. And we are trying to strike the right balance between, you know, introducing restrictions to ensure public safety but not introducing things that are, are too much of a barrier to people to, go, to going to buy them. So, you know, I do, I do take the member's point about, you know, that black market. But there is, you know, I'm sure you've spoken to Police Scotland about this, but, you know, there is a lot of work. Um, it's sort of national um, multi-agency work um, that's gone on by the enforcement agencies. Um, you know, that does in, include, you know, the Fire and Rescue Service, trading standards and so on. Um, and they tackle, you know, illegal sellers of the type that we've been talking about, illegal products that I'm no doubt we'll, we'll talk about as well, and um, various actions, you know, um, like removing websites, you know, that sort of thing, um, referring cases on, and reporting breaches to health and safety executive. So there are there are routes in place that are already being taken, um, and you know, if people see white vans selling fireworks to kids in the street, I'd be very confident that they're going to ring the police and the police will, will go around and deal with that. So, Eleanor, could you add a little bit more detail? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'll, I'll just talk through um, the kind of considerations that was given to displacement um, through a number of different routes, one of which is obviously the black market. Um, so the first kind of, when we were thinking about the licensing system, um, the first kind of option, if you like, for displacement is across the border. So will people cross over the border to purchase fireworks and, and bring them back into Scotland? Um, so the licensing system itself that's set out in the bill does include the requirement for um, people to have a licence to possess um, as well as to, to use and purchase fireworks fireworks in Scotland. So while the bill can obviously not regulate for activity outside of Scotland, once someone crosses back in into Scotland across the border, then, then they would have to have a licence in order to possess um, those fireworks. So that was the first sort of displacement, if you like. Um, the second is around the kind of online legitimate sale of legal firework products, if you like. So again, someone could go online and order the products um, from a country outside of Scotland and, and have that, that delivered. And again, in terms of what is outlined in the bill, 
where any part of that supply takes place in Scotland, so that would include, for example, the delivery of firework products, there will be a requirement of suppliers to check the licence status of that, that individual who is receiving the firework products, and it's anticipated that that would work in a similar way to, for example, other, other age-restricted products. It's probably um, helpful for me just to say at this point that it is illegal to send um, firework product through the kind of normal postal system, um, and all fireworks that are delivered um, do need to be done through a special courier system and need to be clearly marked as, as explosives. And then, obviously, um, the point that you were talking about, uh, specifically the sort of third area of displacement that, that we obviously considered was the, the illegal, the online kind of illegal sales of illegal um, firework products. And I think, as, as the Minister has set out, obviously the purchase of, of fireworks will continue to be subject um, to, to existing legislation and en enforcement routes through, through trading standards at, at the police and the courts. Um, the, the last point that I would just want to make is um, around the importation of dangerous goods, which obviously in, it includes fireworks, and that's obviously a matter for um, UK government um, in the case of, of firework imports um, and the Health and Safety Executive. And in relation to people who may kind of self-import fireworks uh, into the country, that would be substantively the remit of, of Border Force. So I hope that's given you an idea of the kind of areas of displacement that, that we considered as, as the licensing system was being developed. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'll bring in uh, Russell Finlay now, and then I'll bring in Rona Mackay. So, I do have a licensing question, but just a couple of uh, observations in terms of the data. We've learned today what the Crown Office have done and the numbers around the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. But what we still don't know, I don't think, is how many actual incidents have been reported to the police or recorded by the police. And perhaps that's something we could get. Um, we secondly, that. yeah. Um, I mean, your observation about if only Scotland was independent, we might be able to ban fireworks. I don't know if that's what you're seriously proposing. But going back to the licensing question, we heard evidence from uh, a responsible firework shop owner, Norman Donald. He said that licensing and, and this bill would put him out of business, most likely, and put others out of business. Um, and we've also heard evidence of the fabled white van man of Blackburn who roams around giving fireworks or selling fireworks to children. The unintended consequence of this bill, the suggestion is that mm. while it puts legitimate operators out of business, it's an absolute gift to the white van men. Is that really something that you want to see happen? Yeah, there's about five questions there, convener. <laughs> well, ignore the first part if you want. And just, it's about the unintended consequence of putting out of business legitimate, responsible mm. traders yeah. and fueling a black market well, we, in we, fireworks. We don't have the evidence to suggest it will fuel a black market. Uh, and we've looked carefully at the evidence from countries where they've, they've tightened the restrictions. And, and we can't find the evidence to, to say that that has fueled the black market. Um, we've looked at Scotland at the moment. There doesn't seem to be, to be much evidence of a black market in Scotland at the moment. And clearly, um, the agencies that work in that area will, will continue to review that. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to come back to the committee with some evidence on that in a, in a few years' time and be able to talk about you know, what impact that it's had. Um, the reason I, I talked about the ban is because that is something that, when you talk about fireworks and you talk about restricting them, that is, people will often say that. They'll often talk about the merits of a ban or not a ban. And, and I, I did set out that we considered it. And, you know, for, you know, I think the member will accept that for constitutional reasons, um, Scotland is not able to do everything exactly the way it would want to. We have to work within the, the constitutional arrangements. I uh, explained how that, and Natalie explained how that impacted on what we were doing here. But that also, we decided not to pursue a ban for, for policy reasons anyway, because we didn't think it was proportionate. And I've, I've set that out in detail already. Um, you know, if we're talking about um, businesses, yes, I think that there are, there are I think, about 650 um, retailers um, that supply fireworks to the public, and most of them do so on a sort of a seasonal, um, a sort of a, te a temporary basis. So they're particularly supplying them at the typical times of year that you might expect, so around the bonfire season, around New Year. And um, so the provisions in this bill broadly al align with that. There are um, a small number 
Um, so I think it's it's nine. And then there's a, another business that I think, Eleanor, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, that I think um, sell and also import. So that takes us up to 10. So there, there are 10 businesses that, that sell fireworks and they are different than the other, this, the other 650 because they sell fireworks on an all year round basis. So they have a different license to sell. And, um, and clearly the provisions um, on supply that are in this piece of legislation um, will potentially have an impact on those businesses. So what we've said is that um, when we can receive evidence on the, um, the type of effect that it's had on those businesses, that we will develop a, a, compensation, assist, um, a compensation scheme um, for those businesses um, to, make, to make sure that they are, are not going to suffer in that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'll bring in Rona Mackay and then we'll move on to uh, some questions around restriction of use and supply. Rona. Okay, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I just want to stick with the licensing theme at the moment. Um, we, we know that there's widespread support for licensing. I think it was 84 per cent, you said, you said Minister. Um, can you, and, and again, I, I know um, the detail of this probably hasn't, isn't fixed yet because this part is not happening until next year, but is it possible for you to give us a kind of timeline for the, when the licensing scheme will be set up and, and running? Okay. Uh, so with the licensing scheme, um, we we want to get this right. So um, it's like in the exchange that we've had between Paul and McNeil, we want to make sure that it, it's working really well and that we get it right. So we've got a, a quite a bit of a, um, you know implementation work that we need to do on that. And so um, we think that that should all be um, set up and working um, around about by the end of 2023. But I'm afraid we're not able to be um, any more specific than that because we have got to um, do some consultations. We've got a lot of work to do with the stakeholders, as you would imagine, on this to, to get that right. And um, we'll also have to do secondary legislation on that as well. Eleanor, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I suppose the only thing just to add is, is one of the main tasks, obviously, will be, um, you know, bringing in a new IT system that is robust and, and kind of fit for purpose and, um, you know, developing a specification for that in, in partnership, particularly with, with Police Scotland, as well as, as our other stakeholders and, and commissioning that to the relevant provider. So just, just to add to, to what the Minister said there, I think that will be one of the, the key tasks for the licensing system. Okay. And can I ask um, about the sort of time scale of um, the, the five, I think it's five years the licence would be valid for. Mm -hmm. Has there been thought given to the, the, the possibility that during that five years someone might commit an offence or, you know, um, and, and what, what, what would the process be there? Be there? Would it be revoked mm -hmm. or...? Yes, so um, if somebody is convicted of a fireworks-related offence and they have a valid fireworks licence, um, a court will have the power to revoke that person's fireworks licence. And if they do that, then they have a duty to inform Scottish ministers that they have done so. Um, if a court convicts someone um, of a fireworks-related offence but does not revoke their licence for whatever reason, the court would still have a duty to inform Scottish ministers that that person ha has been convicted of a fireworks-related offence. Um, individuals themselves, licence holders, are also mandated to provide updates in any material change in circumstance to Scottish ministers if they are a licence holder, and we would expect that to cover um, a firework-related uh, so offence. So it would only apply to firework-related offences, not if the individual had been convicted of you know, assault or antisocial behaviour or anything like that, only firework-related? It covers um, offences under existing fireworks um, legislation as well as offences under um, this um, bill. Um, it also covers any other offence <clears throat> Excuse me. Where the misuse of fireworks or pyrotechnic articles has been a factor, so for example, if somebody is um, charged with, you know, an antisocial behaviour offence or um, an offence of attack on emergency service worker, if fireworks has been an element of, of that offence, then it's possible for it to be considered. Um, but in terms of wider offences, then no, that is not set out in the bill. Okay, um, and just. Can I just ask about, and again, this is a detail you, 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 you probably don't have yet, but it's just about cost. And we know that in Northern Ireland, a, a licence costs 
anywhere between about 100 and 160 pounds. And, and Minister, you said you were conscious that you didn't want to make it prohibitive for um, families to, to purchase um, to purchase them. Um, do you have any idea of the scale of, of what it might cost? Any ballpark figure you could give us just now? Yeah. So the financial memorandum, which I, I think will have been provided to the committee, uh, that we so we did a financial modelling exercise on this, and so we modelled. Um, license fees of either £20, £30 or £50 for the five-year licence. And uh, we, we looked at that and at those amounts in particular um, because when we took into account other sort of similar licensing schemes that are already um, operating in Scotland, um, particularly the air weapons licensing one. So um, we will do a further consultation on this um, if Parliament agrees to the legislation. And we will then go on to seek... Um, you know, views on what the appropriate level of fee would be. And I think, um, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, Northern Ireland, uh, you know, I think their, their fees are significantly higher for, the, for those. And, and I do think that's an important point. I think it has to not act as a barrier to people. Um, so if you think, you know, you're a community group and you want to, to put on a fireworks display, I would imagine the costs involved in that are fairly significant. And so potentially paying £30 for a five-year licence may not seem disproportionate in, in that context. And then, sort of finally, just on licensing, um, I'm just thinking that it could be a pretty ex you know, big workload um, and have an impact on local authorities having to issue these licences. Um, has any kind of impact assessment on local authorities been done in terms of resources or, 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 or staff that they may to, need to do? And, and Eleanor, you, you mentioned the new, the new IT system. Would that be provided to every local authority? So just, just to clarify that the bill sets out that um, the licensing system will be um, managed by Scottish ministers, so Scottish Government on, on behalf of Scottish ministers, so it wouldn't be something that would be devolved to individual um, local authorities. Um, the consultation in 2021 over the summer that, that, that we ran um, asked um, people's opinions on you know, who should run and administer the licensing system, and that included national government, another national organisation or, or local authorities and, and um, the kind of feedback that we had from that, that it is that it would be most appropriately done by Scottish Government to ensure that we had a kind of national system and that there weren't barriers with people purchasing in one local authority and then using it in another. So this, the, the licensing system would be administered and run by Scottish Government. Okay. Right. So, so people apply to, to the Scottish Government for a, for a licence? Okay. I hadn't appreciated that. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can, I, can I just pick up on that, that point around licences? Um, obviously, you've, you've helpfully sort of explained it would be a Scottish Government role to administer the licensing scheme. I, I think earlier on uh, in some of your responses to the licensing questions, you mentioned Police Scotland potentially having a role. Or did I pick that up incorrectly? Um, no, no, you didn't. Um, so the IT system that is developed for the licensing system will need to be aligned with Police Scotland because they will have to have, you know, real time information and data on license holders in order to enforce um, the, the relevant offences. So it would be Scottish Government, but obviously we would do that very much in partnership with Police Scotland to make sure that it worked for all the stakeholders. Perfect. That, that, that's helpful. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know, Pauline McNeil, do you have a follow-up that you'd like to ask um, around licensing or are you happy for us to move on? D just a quick supplementary um, in terms of Rona Mackay's line of questioning about the and, and you've said clearly that you wouldn't want the cost to be prohibitive I think there would be a big difference between £20 and £50 given the cost of living crisis so I think it would be useful to know when that information is available because £20, I might not be so concerned. £50, that would concern me, and I would <clears throat> think that would definitely be prohibitive in these times for a lot of families. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think, Colette Stevenson, you've got a follow-up question you'd like to ask, and then I'll move on to um, restrictions on use and supply and bring in Fulton. Yep, thanks, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, one of the sort of recurring areas of questioning that I've had from the panel members that have came... Um, before us is um, to do with um, silent or low noise um, fireworks. 
And I was just wondering if the minister and their team had explored that area. Uh, for me, particularly from a nuisance aspect, and, and then we touched upon um, the impact it's had on animals and, and people with new, neural diversity issues, is that in some way would go you know, to mitigating it? And also, um, is it possible um, for that to be implemented? How does that work? And the other thing as well I would like to know more about is if you reduce the cost of that, is that not more of an incentive for people to purchase low noise fireworks um, rather than mm -hmm. the, the categories that, that are listed in our papers? Yes, so um, I think um, Colette Stevenson makes a really good point there. Um, I was certainly was really interested in this because I think um, we can all see that um, silent fireworks or, or reduced noise fireworks would go a long way to addressing, um, not all, because obviously it wouldn't necessarily address uh, misuse, but it would certainly address a lot of the um, concerns that people have, um, particularly you know um, those that are more disturbed by the noise the fireworks make and over a long period and that they're quite sporadic and that can be very disturbing, obviously, from people who have animals, etc. So um, we did look into this. Um, we were advised by um, experts um, in the industry that at present there, there isn't a recognised standard um, or specification to identify or distinguish, um, and this is just at the moment, um, fireworks that could be classed as um, um, lower noise fireworks. So I think this is something um, that potentially maybe the industry um, might be, be working on at the moment. I don't know if Eleanor can add any more to that in a moment. Um, so what we've done in an attempt to sort of future-proof the bill and accepting that, you know, I think this is a, an interesting um, development that could be beneficial, is that we've um, put an ability in the bill to be able to update the bill. So should this become something that we, we can identify and we, we can use, then we are able to update the bill on that accordingly. Um, anything further to add on that, Eleanor? No. no. That's welcome that that's been parked effectively so and it'll be good news for my dog anyway so i'll be sure to let her know thanks <laughs> on, on that on that happy note i'll i'll bring in fulton mcgregor the minister and officials uh, and i don't have a, a dog to represent uh, here at committee but uh, unfortunately um convener if you're all right i've got a couple of question questions on the restrictions but I did want to pick up a couple of other uh, questions from last week's evidence because I think it's both uh, Jamie Green and Pauline McNeil have indicated, um, and I think you'll have probably seen it, Minister, it was quite powerful evidence last week that the industry gave. Um, and I think what was most striking about it um, in the context of this bill uh, is that it was really the only evidence we've heard that's counter to the bill. Um, if you like, every, all the other evidence that we've heard from stakeholders has been very supportive, and I know you'll be... Um, very, very pleased about that. Um, uh, one of the things that got mentioned last week it was uh, the Republic Island and other countries. So I was just wondering what um, evidence that you had taken from these countries bringing the bill forward. Now I know the Republic Islands got more or less a full ban, but the evidence that was given to us last week and challenged us as MSPs in this committee that's, that's scrutinising this legislation is that uh, a black markets forum there. And I know you've talked a wee bit about that now. Um, the clerks did ask for information from Ireland, which we got back. Uh, and it does seem to be, I mean, I mean, I've only been scanning it right enough, but it does seem to be a mixed picture in terms of uh, firework incidents, with seizures, value of I items seized, um, although there's a general downward decline with both of these, but it goes up and down over the years. Certainly a, an overall decline in prosecutions, which is good from 11 in 2015 to 2 at the latest, which was 2020. Um, so that you know that does seem to be a general trend as well, but probably most importantly, the the, um, the firearms and explosive justice service delivery department uh, have uh, said, and I'll quote: "While instances of illegal firework use do still occur in Ireland, in particular in the run-up to Halloween, the department believes the restrictions in place considerably mitigate against the widespread misuse." and the associated distress and risk they can cause to public safety and property. So that seems to be um, a, a positive thing that we got back, uh, you know, given the evidence we heard last week. But I, I did wonder what um, evidence and information you got from other countries, Republic Island. I think Hawaii was mentioned last week as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to have a, a look at what other countries are doing because there's no point in you know reinventing the wheel, if you like, w with some of this policy. And if we can find things that have been working really well elsewhere, then it's, it's obviously a good idea to look at that. And equally, the converse is true, that you want to look at where, where things have not worked very well elsewhere, if you can find the data. The problem often with it is that it, it can be very difficult to um, find... Um, the right, you know, real data that you can use that can sort of illustrate the policy, um, and that obviously it's a it's a different setting. So that means that you know taking what's working well somewhere and then just trying to drop it into Scotland isn't always advisable because of obviously the difference in the context. So we sort of took all that into account. The review group specifically did um, spend some of their time looking at other jurisdictions to to see uh, what was working elsewhere and, and how it was going, and um, particularly um, obviously Northern Ireland and and Ireland. Now, um, those two are not the same, obviously. Northern Ireland has, has the licensing system and Ireland has um, a complete ban. So, again, the contexts there are, are quite different. But I think what we have seen um, from both of those, um, it looks as if from the data that we can see that there has been a reduction in harms um, in both of those settings. But I'll let Eleanor, um, who's probably found the, the right page of our briefing, to come in and give us a little bit more detail on that point. I mean, really, just just to add to what what the minister has said there, um, international case study research was commissioned um, by the fireworks review group when it was taking forward its work, and and that was really to try and you know consider the approaches that were in place internationally that aligned with the options that they were looking at to where it was possible to actually look at the data around the, the actual benefits and the actual drawbacks of, of similar measures in, in place. And, and that report was published um, alongside the, the review group report. Um, that included case studies of, as the Minister said, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Now, I mean, of course, um, the drivers for introducing restrictions in various different countries will, will vary. Um, and I think one of the, the broad conclusions from all of that work is that there tends to be a kind of lack of metrics and a lack of data in place for anybody to say definitively what, what impact that has had. But broadly speaking, very broadly, um, what we do see from those specific examples of, of Ireland and, and uh, Northern Ireland is, is positive changes in terms of some of the data that, that is available. So in Northern Ireland, for example, we see quite a marked reduction um, in injury levels, firework-related injuries, um, coinciding with the introduction of, of, of the licensing scheme. Um, but, but I think we do need to be cautious about any claims that there is definitive evidence um, uh, uh, around uh, the, the, the impact that, that either of those have had. Yeah, and I think that's a, a fair enough uh, caution, but it, it was evidence that we heard last week, so I think it's, it's worthwhile to ask. Uh, in saying on the evidence last week um, as well, we, the industry have also uh, got a 10-point plan that I know that the, the Minister will be aware of, so I, I wanted to know uh, how much that had maybe been taken into account in forming the, the legislation. And also, uh, if I can just uh, join the questions up together in, a, in uh, the, uh, the interest of time, one of the things that was mentioned last week that was quite uh, striking to myself, and um, I, I might not have a, a, a pet currently, but um, I, I've got three three young kids, and it's probably uh, of interest to me when I, when I heard it was that actually a lot of the injuries associated with fireworks are actually uh, associated, um, according to the evidence we heard last week, actually with spark or use. Uh, and um, I wondered if that is something that the the Minister, the Government and the Group took into account in forming the legislation as well. Okay. Um, yes, we have seen the industry's um, f um, their 10-point plan. I think some of it doesn't um, relate specifically to the Scottish Government. I think that some of them are action points for the UK Government. Um, I think there is some interesting in things in there. Uh, I met with the industry, I think it was about two, two weeks ago, and to listen to you know, um, everything they had to say, take on board all their views that they, they raised. And of course, the industry were part of their review group. So they've been involved in this process um, right from the very start of this piece of work um, as members of their review group. Although, you know, obviously I accept that they didn't support, you know, the final recommendations. And um, from their point of view, they have some concerns over, over the bill. Um, sorry, I can't remember. What was the second part of your question? It was about sparkle. Yes, it was evidence ah, that was given right. to us last week. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. So, um, obviously, we don't have um, complete data 
around injuries, firework related injuries. So obviously if someone is injured by a sparkler or a firework, they may choose to go to their pharmacist or, or their, their doctor and we don't have, have that data. What we do have is um, data from attendance at minor injury unit and accident and emergency departments. Um, and I think the Minister's already gone through that. We can't disaggregate that specific data by type of firework. Um, but our colleagues in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, did a, a fairly detailed survey in 2019 of all um, A&E and minor injury departments, and that was a much more detailed survey. Again, that, that, that's been published, and I can certainly share it with the committee if that would be helpful. But what that shows is the majority of injuries are caused by other fireworks. Um, so 68% were caused by fireworks. Um, I don't have the percentage, but 13 were due to sparklers. So um, the majority are due to due to, to, to F2 and F3 fireworks. Um, and I would say that's to be expected because if there's somebody's injured by a, a sparkler, they may not it may not be severe enough for them to attend um, to, to attend hospital. Uh, and similarly, we have more detailed data from Greater Glasgow and Clyde for the last for last year 2021 and again that shows that um, most of the firework most of the injuries are from fireworks as compared to, to sparklers excellent that's, i think that's good to clarify and um, anything the government can do i haven't watched evidence last week about um, promoting the organized events and such like promote the use of gloves for young children using fireworks i think was a, a sensible suggestion by the industry can be i will move on to the, the questions that you thought i was asking apologies uh, which was around the uh, which is around the restrictions of the use and supply of fireworks um this is a, a line of question i've been asking and asking to various uh, uh, panelists and um obviously the the bills introducing certain days and times when fireworks can be sold and used um are you able to speak a wee bit about the rationale of that? Because it, it's had quite widespread support, as I say, from uh, the majority of stakeholders, uh, which has been really um, reassuring to hear. But obviously we've had some concerns as well about but almost by picking days, you know, we're, we're going into a sort of territory of we're not picking other days, if that makes sense. So I wondered if, um, I wondered if that's something that's been given any consideration to and whether uh, to join, join my questions together, whether you think that... You know, it would be worthwhile giving local authorities some flexibility so that they could look at, you know, certain occasions, it may be sporting occasions or uh, other cultural occasions that maybe people would apply to the local mm -hmm. authority for. Yeah. Um, so during the consultation, so that was the, you know, the 2019 consultation, the 2021 consultation, and I'm sure the committee will, will have heard this um, coming out really strongly in the evidence that they've taken as well. Um, we did hear. Um, a re repeated evidence about um, disturbance caused um, to people by this, this more, I suppose, what we would characterise as unpredictable use of, of fireworks and that this sort of leading, I guess, to this sort of perception that um, firework use had become a lot more prolonged um, than it had it used to be. Um, and that, and I think that I visited the SSPCA um, again a couple of weeks ago now, and they were sort of suggesting to me that for, for pet owners particularly, and I think this would also uh, apply to anybody that, that has issues in this area as well, so that would be including this neurodivergent people too, that knowing when the fireworks are going to be used um, allows people to you know, undertake whatever mitigation that that, that might be. Um, so you know, those that have got neurodivergent conditions, um, maybe they could plan to be somewhere else. Um, people that have pets that are really seriously uh, disturbed by fireworks could obviously seek veterinary advice um, ahead of their use. And I think, I feel quite strongly that that, that sort of more predictable use, I think that's going to be of, of benefit to, to everybody. So um, the review group, they looked at a lot of... Um, I think they commissioned actually analytical work um, to sort of to look at this. They looked at the international evidence that we've we've spoken about in 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 one of the other ones. Um, and I'll ask um, Eleanor to just speak a bit about. I think there was a couple of countries, um, parts of Australia, New Zealand, um, where they'd brought in something similar and, and what effects that that had had there. Um, yes. So again, as part of this international case study research commissioned by the review group, there were a number of of um, areas that 
that were included that had a kind of shorter sales window, um, and that was, I don't have the name of the Australian state in front of me, but it was in one of the Australian states um, and New Zealand. Again, just to, to the caveats that I'll give is, you know, it isn't possible for us to draw direct comparisons um, for, for a number of reasons, but, um, you know, certainly we do see some positive consequences of that in both of, in both of those areas. Yeah. And I do understand, and, and probably on balance, I'm convinced um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the having set days, but I, I would simply comment that it still does seem a wee bit unfair for people uh, with autism or pet, or pet owners or whatever that, you know, come New Year, it's them that have to have mitigation, including leaving their own home. And of course, the last two New Years, it, it, that wouldn't have been an option open to them in, no. in still fireworks yeah. where, yeah. Where, where used. Um, just one further question uh, on I this just, subject, um, convener, if that's okay, and that's about um, whether the uh, government has had any, had carried out any impact assessments mm -hmm. with, with regards to these specific dates uh, on the impact for retailers and organisers, such as the, uh, the the independent retailer from Aberdeen that we heard last week. Yep, um, I think. You know, if we go back to the, your previous point about you know reducing the times that it can be used, and it, you know it's still, you know, having fireworks used during those periods is still going to have an effect on people. But I think the idea is again in the um, in order to be proportionate that this seemed like a good approach to take, and reducing that time of use. It obviously, you know, as I've set out, it allows people to be more prepared for it. So it's not sort of catching people by surprise. They're able to prepare for it a bit more, um, which means that perhaps it becomes um, a bit more to tolerable, I suppose, is probably the way to describe it. Um, and I also wanted to pick up, I forgot to answer your point about flexibility. Um, so we did, we consulted with, um, you know, various faith groups, etc. And we, we wanted to be sure that the dates that we'd picked um, would align caref carefully with that um, and make sure that um, where there were um, dates, you know, particularly for other faiths, etc., that traditionally their celebrations involved fireworks, that we would be able to capture that in, in the, the dates that we were proposing as well um, to make sure that we'd done that. Um, having done that, I think we need to be careful that we don't um, introduce any more confusion. So I think allowing um, further flexibility for local authorities to change those dates, I'm not sure um, I think that might be a good idea. I think that could introduce an element of confusion. I think with this, we've got a lot of work to do to communicate to the public about exactly what these changes are. And, and once we've done that, hopefully people will have a good level of knowledge about what they're allowed to do when and where. Um, so I think that that's quite an important part of it. Um, in terms of um, impact assessments, um, I think Eleanor will be able to give us more information on, on that. Yeah. Um, so on that specific point, obviously a full range of of impact assessments ha have been undertaken and, and published in, in relation to the bill. And I think the specific impact assessment that, 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 you, you're, that relates to your question is the business and, and regulatory impact assessment and, and that certainly recognises the potential impact of the restricted um, days um, of supply on, on those retailers who are selling fireworks, particularly the retailers who the small number of retailers who are permitted to, to, to supply fireworks um, throughout the year. I have to say um, you know, limited economic data, you know, is available from, from the, those retailers. Um, we did hold a, a specific consultation event back in, in 2021 while the consultation was live with, um, uh, specifically with specialist firework retailers, but but um, we, we've reflected the economic data that we do have, um, but but that is, that is limited. I think it is important to say that um, retailers will be able to continue to supply fireworks to those who are in the exempt groups um, out with those permitted periods. So that will include community groups and that will include um, professional firework operators. Um, we don't have um, firm data on this, but we do know that some of those specialist firework retailers are also professional display operators. So it may be that that element of the business is enhanced by the measures that are included within the bill. Okay, thanks. I'm going to bring in Jamie Green just in a moment for a, for a follow-up. Um, can I just quickly jump back to a quick question around licensing? One of the things that's come up um, sort of repeatedly, if you like, is just looking, the members ex looking for a little bit more detail on the proposals around licensing. So I just wonder if um, perhaps in that regard there, this might be an opportunity for us to ask a wee bit about the practicalities of the licensing scheme as, as you see it being um, put in place. So, for example, 
would there be an online option? Um, would there be ID documents required uh, to be produced? What sorts of timescales might be required from the point that somebody applies to the point that an application is completed and, uh, and endorsed? So really just a little bit of more practical detail uh, around the process for people applying for licences would be really helpful. Yes, no, I, I think that's um, a good line of questioning. Uh, obviously, we would um, anticipate the majority of it will be done online. I think most people um, are, are able to use that now, and it's obviously highly efficient for, for many people. But we will have an alternative for, for people who are obviously not able to, to access that or use that. So we'll have a sort of a paper-based alternative for, for people that that might work better for. Um, Eleanor, can you um, yeah, I can, add some more detail? Yeah, I can certainly talk you through the process if that would be helpful. And forgive me if it's a, a slightly long answer. Um, so the basic principle is that all members of the public, including community groups, will be required to apply for a fireworks licence if they are not in, in one of the exempt groups that is set out. And they will be required to have that licence before they can purchase, possess or use fireworks. In terms of the, what that would involve, um, first of all, it would involve them completing um, a training course on the safe, appropriate and responsible use of fireworks in the three months preceding um, that application, and that is set out in the bill. Um, future regulations, as the Minister has said, will set out the operational detail of that, and we envisage at this stage that that will include it primarily being an online course, although the bill doesn't set out that it has to be an online course, but we imagine um, that it will be an online course. But of course, consideration has been given to those who, who might not have internet access. Um, the, the regulations will also cover information on what, the co what, what content is in the course, but that will include things like how to use fireworks safely, information on how to store and dispose of fireworks safely, um, rules and regulations in relation to where and when they can be used, and also the consideration um, in relation to the appropriate use of fireworks. Um, the second thing that the person would then be required to do would be apply to the Scottish Government for a licence, and that will involve filling out an application form and providing proof of successful completion of the training course, as well as disclosing any previous convictions related to the misuse of fireworks or pyrotechnics, as well as disclosing any previous licences that have been um, revoked or, or cancelled. And again, it would be future regulations that set out the detail operation of that system. So that would include you know, the content of the application form and the information that is required from applicants, the fee that needs to be paid, the time in which the application must be made in order to manage those spikes um, in demand to kind of coincide with traditional firework periods, as I've said, the content of the training course uh, and the length of time that, that the, the licence is, is valid for. That, that, thanks very much. That, that's helpful. I've got some more questions around that, but I won't, I won't ask them just now. Um, so I'll just come back to uh, Jamie Green. Thanks. <clears throat> um, Minister, you've talked quite a lot about um, the working group <clears throat> and uh, the various members of it. Um, I, I raised this with the industry representatives last week. Uh, in their written evidence, they said that they believed that too much weight had been given to the voices in the group who, I quote, wanted to see more restrictions and woefully insufficient weight has been given to the industry who have been warning about the serious unintended consequences of the bill. Now, I, to be fair, I did challenge him on that and said, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Your interest is in the commercial success of your members. But interestingly, the British Pyrotechnic Association said that the majority of their members actually put on professional displays and have no vested interest in the retail uh, market at all, uh, either in the restriction of sale, purchase or use of over-the-counter fireworks. And that their views on this, around the unintended consequences, around the black market, around uh, what they think will be the, out the outcomes of this legislation, are purely based on their professional judgment and their decades of experience in the fireworks industry. That was their response. How would you respond to that? So, so you're right to say that, uh, and I think we've, we've covered this already, that the, the industry were um, you know, members of their view group. You know, there were full members, like all the other members of the group. Um, the group uh, decided on what um, their remit was, what evidence they were going to look at, 
um, and then obviously came up with a with the action plan at the end of that, of which you know this um, legislation in front of you for, forms part of, but not all of the recommendations that were put forward. Um, and as a government, we are working um, through all of those recommendations. Um, and I think the industry. Um, we're certainly fully involved in that process. You know, they um, gave some very helpful information that has been worked into um, the legislation that, that we've got now. And you know, I'm still, you know, as I said, I met with the industry a couple of weeks ago. We had a, a, a long, full, and frank discussion. Um, obviously, their views are different about um, the, the conclusions that they they would draw from this. Uh, is that they would like things to have gone in a different way, but they were they were fully involved from the start of this, and their views have been been and some of their views have been taken on board, and, and other views haven't. And I think um, it's like, you know, you get in a lot of situations. We probably had members of the review group that would like to have seen the the regulations go even further in the direction of you know public safety, animal welfare, etc. And the industry were probably somewhere more on this side, with you know perhaps wanting more of a maintenance of the status quo. And I would suggest. Um, to the committee that we've probably ended up um, somewhere in the middle um, with a view to create something that responded to what the public wanted to do. Uh, and I think I've set out you know, fairly clearly at the start, in, in the beginning, that there is a very strong desire from the public to, to change the way that we, we sell and use fireworks. There's a lot of support for the measures in the bill um, that I, I read out at the start as well. So um, I think we need to be cognisant of that as well. Um, we did obviously look very carefully at the unintended consequences, and I think we have we have spoken about that. So we, we looked at that through the three different lenses. Um, again, we there isn't a lot of data that we could use, but the data that we could find that we used to inform this. And again, I think that comes back to some of the you know the exchanges that we, we've had with other members of the committee about making sure you know that the license system is easy to use, making sure it's not too expensive to use. Um, so that we don't create barriers to people buying fireworks. And also, you know, we've accepted that there may be um, a very small number of, of fireworks um, suppliers that may be adversely impacted by the provisions in the legislation. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, you know, we have said that we will set up a compensation scheme for them. I'm sure that'll be very welcome. Um, I guess what struck me really was just how adamant they were that, that their opposition to the government's plans were not based on the commercial interests of the members, but on their direct experience of the fireworks industries, not just in this country, but overseas as well. Uh, and that was very pronounced, and I think that came through in their evidence, which is why uh, I, I wanted to ask you that. Now, obviously, the sale, use and purchase are the, the three prongs that the government are using to, in, to introduce restrictions. Can I ask specifically two things? One is, do you are you cognisant of uh, concerns that people will stockpile in terms of purchasing and possessing and storing fireworks in their homes or in other locations out with the prescribed periods which it will be legal to purchase them on? And secondly, are you confident that there will be no legal challenges to the rather arbitrary dates that have been set around the sale and use of fireworks as prescribed in the bill? Um, can you find me the sheet on the... Not the stockpiling one, the other one about the legal... The legal challenge one. I don't know if I can find that one. Sorry, I've got so many pieces of paper in this pack. It's really difficult to find the piece of paper that you need at the right time. Yeah, so stockpiling um, was something that we looked into. Um, obviously, that's you know, it's not something that we want to see because I think we can all understand the, the inherent dangers in stockpiling large amounts of explosives. Um, you know, if that's not done in the right way. So we did look at that, um, and I think that the permitted days of use. So they're, they're extending slightly beyond when fireworks can be supplied. So, um, and this has been done um, specifically because we want to avoid a situation where, you know, if someone goes to buy fireworks at the very end of the supply period, um, let's say they, they plan to have, you know, a fireworks event in their garden or whatever, and then they can't use them because, let's say, the weather's absolutely appalling or something happens that they can't use them. Um, we didn't want them to, be, to have to store them then until the next period when they could use them. So, we, so we've added that little bit in there to give that period of grace um, so that that doesn't happen. Um, I think that we're... There doesn't seem to be an awful lot of evidence that this might be a problem. I think, again, this is something that we would want to, to keep an eye on. Um, at the moment, um, there's obviously a fairly short period of time when people can use uh, fireworks at, at around about the New Year time. So we already have, I guess, some um, experience, I guess, of looking at 
um, a fairly short time period where people can use them. And we're not seeing a lot of stockpiling uh, around as a result of, of that being the case. Um, but this is certainly um, something that, that we, you know, we would be intending on keeping an eye on. Eleanor, have you anything to add on the, the stockpiling issue? No. No. No, no is that there? Yeah. Um, give it context. So you, you've picked five periods of the year. One's a Chinese festival, the other one Diwali, a Sikh festival, and two secularly celebrated festivals of New Year and uh, Halloween stroke Guy Fox period. Um, if I had other uh, religious or secular um, events, celebrations, etc., and I wanted to celebrate those as a family or in my own backyard or in, in another space as prescribed. Um, the fact that the government has chosen these very specific dates, do you think that would leave you open to any form of legal challenge by other religious organisations or other groups or communities who feel like by default you've created an exclusive uh, an exclusive zone of dates rather than an inclusive ones. I think uh, I did. I think I did set this out earlier. We did. Con we did consult with all the, the faith groups. So um, we do feel that we've captured um, all the dates that we feel. Um, you know that there might be particular of religious significance where fireworks are traditionally used as part of the celebrations, and we feel we've captured that. I think as well, you know, the day the days that that we we have got, they you know they broadly align um, with the existing dates. So um, I think that we are quite confident that that, that doesn't f fall foul of the legislation. Yes. Um, I don't know if um, Natalie wants to to say anything further on that. Hi, there's also a power within the legislation to add to or amend the dates if required, if further information came to light that we had missed a particular date that we'd want to include in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like uh, a marvellous amendment that yeah. someone would have introduced anyway. Um, and the, the final point is, is it the case that uh, under the proposals, you could be in a scenario where um, outside of the defined periods of using fireworks, if you want to use fireworks to celebrate an event or an occasion, the only way you can do it will be through an organised display company or someone who is exempt from the, the regulations. Do we not end up in a really bizarre scenario where if you can afford to do that, you can, but if you want to do it yourself, you can. Are we not just creating a fireworks class division of those who can afford to will anyway and those who can't are being restricted. Does that seem fair and proportionate? Um, I think on balance, you know, taking all the provisions across the bill, I think it is designed and I think it does achieve the aim of being fair and proportionate. Um, you know, obviously the example you use there, if people, you know, have, I would say, there is quite adequate provision across the year in order to use fireworks, but I do completely accept the member's point that that may not align with, some, with an individual's desire to use fireworks on a day on which you're not now if the Parliament agrees to this legislation, you wouldn't be able to use fireworks. But I think there is enough sort of flexibility within this um, to still allow fireworks use. Um, so obviously um, public displays is mentioned by the member. So, I mean, for community groups, so I, I suppose this comes back to, you know, Fulton's point about, um, you know, local authorities. I know some areas have specific, you know, days that um, are of interest to them. If you know, that falls within the uh, agreed period. You know, it could be um, a community group could hire a professional display. If that was um, across a, a number of people, I guess that would mitigate the cost there to an extent. So, um, but I think we have to look at the bill um, as, a, as a whole uh, in the, what we're trying to do here. Um, and, you know, the, the, all the provisions have been specifically designed in order to, um, yes, look at the evidence, um, make sure that we're not um, getting into the territory of creating too many unintended consequences and, you know, reflect the desire that the public had in order to reduce this misuse um, uh, of fireworks. And so I think on balance, the bill does do what it was intended to do. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, we're just coming into the last 20, 25 minutes of the session, and we've still got members have still got a few areas they'd like to uh, ask questions around. So if I can ask, uh, as usual, for uh, succinct questions and responses, that would be helpful. So I'll now bring in uh, Russell Finlay to um, pick up on some proxy purchase questions. Yes. Um, now, last week, Fraser, Fraser Stevenson of the BFA told us that he uh, or his organisation had produced a 10-point plan and sent that to the Minister in 2020, point four of which is to raise the age in which anyone can buy fireworks from 18 to 21. Now, given that we've heard today that the average age of those prosecuted is 22, this seems like quite a sensible proposal from the industry and perhaps a more sensible and effective starting point than this legislation, which seems to be quite convoluted and confusing. Why was the age limit not uh, taken on? Yes, so we did, we did look at this. Um, and uh, I think it was in my uh, response, I think it was Fulton. So yes, we did receive the 10-point plan from the industry. Uh, and as I said before, there were was, there was some things in there that weren't for the Scottish Government. Um, they're for the UK government. There was a number of suggestions in there, and there were some there were some good suggestions in there. Um, I think this is, you know, um, this is something that we did consider. Um, we don't have current plans to raise the minimum age for buying fireworks at the moment, um, because if we were to do a blanket ban on the sale of and use of fireworks um, for adults that are between the age of, let's say, um, 18. And, and 21 or 25, um, we think that could be disproportionate and potentially discriminatory, um, particularly when that's compared to other relevant age limits on, on sort of comparable goods and services. Right. But if it's that age group that's causing most of the criminality, yeah. is it not quite a simple fix? So there's, then there's no other age-restricted products that require you to be over 18 to purchase them, including, you know, air weapons, for example. Right. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just before we move on, um, I'm going to bring in Rona at Mackay just in a moment to pick up on some of the proxy purchase questioning. Um, can I maybe just go back to um, a point around proxy purchase that we, again, members have, have been looking at um, when we've been taking evidence from previous witnesses, and um, it was looking at alternative options around the proposal within the bill uh, at, at, on proxy for under 18s uh, and obviously we, we know that that's one of the key things that we're keen to or the, the, the government is keen to bring forward uh, earlier than the other provisions. Um, now in this section alternative legislative solutions that doesn't seem to mention how the proxy purchase scheme could have been achieved through a different route uh, other than the bill. So I I'm just really wanting to kind of go back to that and ask again if there might be a sort of de different legislative route that could be explored for that particular provision. Um, I think there was, there was a lot of support for that, for the proxy purchasing um, offence um, as being a very obvious kind of gap in the law, if you like. And um, to go back to the exchange that I had with Pauline McNeil earlier, um, the first time this was actually raised with me was in Pollock Shields. So um, that was raised with me by a, a youth worker in Pollock Shields, um, that he had identified that as being a, a gap in the law that he thought should be closed, and that was several years ago. Um, so um, at the moment, um, it's already unlawful for a category F2 and F3 fireworks and other pyrotechnics to be supplied to children under 18, but that's just on a commercial basis. So um, the introduction of this specific offence makes it clear to all adults that any giving, supplying of fireworks or pyrotechnics to those under the age of 18 is a criminal offence with appropriate penalties. Um, I don't know, would it, Natalie, would it be, um, would you be able to pick up um, the part about other legislative um, options with regard to that point? Yes, uh, just to confirm, as you've said, that at the moment it's uh, illegal to supply a firework on a commercial basis, but to apply it to all adults 
uh, it would be necessary to do this through primary legislation, uh, the secondary legislation that is available under the Fireworks Act uh, is in relation to commercial supply, and it would be a provision in which the UK government would have to bring regulations, not the Scottish government. That's okay. that's helpful because obviously it's something that we have been looking at in terms of the option to perhaps pull off that that part of the bill, if you like, and deal with it separately in order that the other provisions didn't have to be, you know, we weren't restricted to the timescales around those other provisions. But that, that's helpful clarification. OK, thank you for that. And I'll now bring in Rona Mackay. Thank you. Convener, um, just a couple of um, brief questions from me. One that I meant to ask earlier when we were uh, discussing the licensing. Um, and I apologies if I've missed this in a previous answer, by the way. Um, the registered training course, um, do we have any detail on that? Who will be providing that? Has, has someone been chosen to do that? Or No. Is it likely to be a commercial body or the fire service? Or So, we, I mean, that would be considered as part of the consultation that will right. take place um, once the bill is passed it and regulation. So we yeah. would obviously look at options including commercial suppliers as well as third sector yeah. organisations such as the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents who have the fireworks code, for example, um, as well as, uh, as other organisations. I just wondered if yeah. been, there was a firm view on it. Um, well, the other thing really is... Um, and, and the Minister has alluded to this earlier, about public awareness. I mean, I think if this bill passes um, this year, the public may expect big changes around November, which, which you know, with the best will in the world, won't be happening, really, um, in terms of, you know, purchasing and, and setting off fireworks. Um, so it's really just to, if you had any detail on, on the sort of um, the, the comms and the public awareness campaign that will come out to, yeah. so that people's, you know, to manage people's expectations, as it were. Yeah. I, know, I agree with that. I think public, the public messaging and, and public campaign is an extremely important part of this whole picture. Um, so in advance of Bonfire Night 2020, uh, 2021, 2020, um, we had a number of um, awareness raising and public safety campaigns. So um, in fact, there were three different ones that ran. Um, and I'll just um, speak about those because uh, we're going to be repeating them again this year. So the first is the nationwide one, and that's called Impact of Fireworks. Um, and that's to improve people's awareness and understanding of the impacts that fireworks can have on people and on animals and encourage people using fireworks to think about the impact on others and also for them to follow the, obviously the safety instructions and the fireworks code. Um, the second one that's run um, has been running over the last few years and will run again this year is one that's in partnership with the charity Crime Stoppers. Um, it's supported by Police Scotland as well and it focuses on areas where there's higher levels of misuse and it um, focuses on improving awareness and understanding, um, particularly of the existing rules and regulations, uh, so that and how and when to you know, um, report misuse of fireworks, um, and potentially anonymously as well. So again, that may maybe come back to earlier points. If people are seeing perhaps illegal fireworks being sold in their area, this gives people an anonymous way to obviously report that information. And the third one, um, is provided advice in retail outlets. So that's at the point of sale for consumer fireworks, and that's on safe and appropriate use. So we'll be planning on rerunning them again um, this year. And if the Parliament agrees um, to the provisions in the bill, um, some of the bill will be, um, we hope, in operation before Bonfire Night this year. And that will be the proxy purchasing offence and also the provisions relating to pyrotechnics as well. Mm, OK. And, and, and that... That message about what's in the bill for this year yeah. would be part of the, you know, as well as the stuff you've done before. Would Absolutely. Be of, yeah. yeah, because I think it's it's key. Um, the, the best way that we're going to get the culture change on fireworks that, you know, we, we started talking about right at the beginning is to make sure the public have the level of awareness about, you know, how to use fireworks safely and how to, you know, for everyone to respect everyone else, if you like, so that we, we get to that culture change and also how to keep themselves safe. And I think that we need to make sure that level of knowledge is strong. And we do that by, you know, consistent public messaging um, that we're repeating year on year. And obviously, every time the regulations change, we will, you know, we'll update the messaging accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kavina. Thanks very much. OK, we'll move swiftly on to some questions around um, control zones. I'll bring in Russell Finlay again. Yes, indeed. Uh, I was going to ask about the no firework zone as they were initially called at some stage in the consultation process? 
no firework area, yeah. right? And it's now become a firework control zone. Yeah. And not only is there perhaps risk, people might not understand the, what that all means, would it not have been perhaps easier just to have no firework zones, given there, are, there appear to be two broad problems? One is the misuse of fireworks mm -hmm. in a violent or antisocial way, and the other is just their legitimate use, but the noise and dis yeah. the, the distress that causes to pets mm -hmm. and certain people. Yeah. So, so why not, if you want to go down this route, create no firework zones so that people can have peace and quiet? Yeah. So, they, yes, it was, I think, called firework control areas. I think that was in, Eleanor, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, was that in the first consultation? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, for just in the first consultation. Yes. Um, and we then changed it to firework control zones because we thought that um, when we put it into the legislation that this more accurate, accurately reflected um, what the provision um, would be designed to do. So I think that I think that it will that this provision will have an impact both on the, the misuse, as the, as the member suggested, and also on the legitimate use, which also can be, um, I think, problematic for for a, a number of people. Um, and the idea of this is just to, is to reduce um, the use of fireworks in particular areas where, you know, they're currently um, impacting on people, I guess, because of their sort of prolonged and un unpredictable nature. Um, you know, I think it gives local authorities that ability to um, look at what's happening in their area and then uh, take action um, in order to try to address this. This was a theme that, that came through very strongly to me when we were um, developing the provisions of the bills. That local authorities were very interested in having this particular provision um, to, to, um, because they felt it would help them address the issues that they're seeing and it would give them that um, control over you know, setting the areas, etc. And um, we also might see areas being um, designated like this, you know, that are near maybe um, um, care homes, older people's homes, um, shelters for animals, you know, this type of thing. So it just gives that sort of degree of, of flexibility. Um, but what we have said is that public displays can, till, can still take place um, during them. And also um, community groups, et cetera, would still be able to put on um, um, displays as well. I can see how um, there is an argument for saying that, that, that maybe that hasn't quite struck the right balance. So I would be interested in, um, to hear what the committee's view is, is on that. Yeah, just going back to that, it's not just those two uh, criteria that can, within these control zones, it can mm. also be private homeowners yeah. bringing in a company. Yeah. So I suppose people living in these areas think they may have some peace and quiet, but in fact it changes nothing because fireworks will still be going off in these areas. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what might confuse people. Mm -hmm. I think it would, I would envisage this, well, it will result in a reduction overall of the amount of fireworks and the, you know, the unpredictable and sporadic nature of them. Um, but I do take the member's point about the, the use of private displays. Um, and that is something that I am, I'm open to considering, you know, um, the Parliament's view on that one. Um, and I'd be very interested to hear what the committee, you know, come back to me in the report, um, particularly about that provision. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you want to... Uh, just pick up yeah. the next um, questions yeah. around pyrotechnic articles. Yeah, now, so the Scottish Police Federation have um, given evidence to the uh, effect that the good intent behind this legislation mm. might be undermined by the what they call bad legislation as drafted. Uh, one of their specific concerns was around pyrotechnics and their increased use of football matches and other large-scale events. Now, the Federation said that the bill should be amended for this to become simple possession being an offence, mm -hmm. with the obvious uh, uh, clause to protect uh, of, of reasonable um, use or reasonable possession for legitimate users. Mm -hmm. Now, Police Scotland have since written to us and uh, said much the same thing. Mm -hmm. They believe that the law should have a simple possession mm -hmm. uh, written into it. Is that something you're going to take on? Um, so we did consider this, um, and I'll ask Dave to come in in, in a minute and um, sort of explain the process that we went through to get to the point that we're at. So obviously misuse of pyrotechnics, you know, is a, is a growing problem, um, and that has been evidenced to us by um, Police Scotland, obviously at certain events, certain places. Um, so we were really keen to, to get a provision into place um, that worked for this. 
Um, I think there are gaps in the legislation at the moment relating to carrying and possession of, of pyrotechnics um, that might inhibit the police from taking proactive and preventative action. And I think the key part of that as well is that before a situation becomes dangerous and then it gets really difficult to control. So that's um, what we're seeking to achieve um, with this. So um, Police Scotland in 2017, um, they had a, a working group um, on this and they presented recommendations from that. And we also had um, a Scottish government hosted um, sort of stakeholder discussions in 2021 as well. And that proposed an offence of being in possession of a pyrotechnic in a public place without reasonable excuse or lawful authority. And that, that was the proposal that was initially um, considered and consulted on as part of the, of the 2021 consultation. However, when we were uh, developing the legislation, um, the potential for the wider that, you know, that, that had been drafted, that, the wider provision as it was drafted at that point, uh, we felt that there was potential for that to have unintended consequences. So this was the potential for it to kind of deter, if you like, legitimate and necessary use of pyrotechnic articles um, for personal safety. So that would be things like visual distress signals, etc. Um, that became a concern and um, we thought that a more specific offence needed to, to be developed and that results in the provision that we can see in the bill now. Um, would you like to add some more sure. details? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's probably um, important just to add that um, we did have discussions with Police Scotland throughout um, this. So in terms of the narrower offence, they were aware um, of what was being proposed um, and they were uh, they did tell us that they were satisfied that um, relating to the evidence that, that we were able to gather um, in relation to that, that it was a, a kind of proportionate way forward. Um, certainly the, the point that they're making that a narrower offence is more difficult for them than a broader offence, we absolutely accept that it's, it's, it's more difficult to do. However, the, the, the sort of, I suppose the key things round about here uh, were obviously, in, in terms of our considerations, were obviously that we had to consider um, our obligation to be as uh, uh, to take the least obtrusive method to um, fulfil the policy objective. Um, we obviously had to uh, demonstrate that anything we were doing was proportionate and necessary. It had to be evidence based, and the evidence in this case uh, was the, the document provided by Police Scotland, which I understand they've also provided to the, to the committee. And that's the best evidence that we actually have um, about pyrotechnics misuse, and it does kind of suggest that it's in particular areas, although. As with other evidence, we accept that you know it's not perfect evidence. Um, it's, it's the best that we, we, that's a bit available to us. Um, additionally, obviously, things have to be compatible with human rights. Um, and as the minister has mentioned, very importantly for us, in, in particularly in relation to the pyrotechnics, is that we don't inhibit the legitimate use of pyrotechnics for safety purposes. Um, and we are really very, very conscious of that um, in terms of what we were doing and trying to make sure that it was very clear that we would not be inhibiting people from uh, taking safety players when, the, when they're going out to sea, when they're going out to, into the hills or whatever. So those were the kinds of things that, that, that we were taking into account. And on that basis, uh, we felt that what's being proposed in the bill is a proportionate response to the evidence that we have. We accept that it might be it's, it's more difficult than a broader offence, but we don't feel that we have the evidence to go for a, to, to, uh, go for a broader offence. And so that's kind of how we've ended up where we are at the moment. Just quickly coming back on that, the Federation said that their officers have got the common sense to not you know, go arresting people mm -hmm. on mountaintops or in marinas who've got flares for legitimate reasons, and that would uh, be the purpose of keeping this very simple. Um, is it now the case that that is completely off the table? Well, I think the, the way I'm looking at this is that you know, obviously we need to create, we're responding to um, a public health um, or public safety issue that we, we see. Um, we have worked on this with the stakeholders over the last few years in order to d develop the right provision. Um, we need a provision that's obviously workable. We think this provision is workable. Um, it's, it's my job as a minister to um, use the least intrusive legislation in order to get to the objective, the public safety objective as possible. So I think the fact that, you know, obviously we said, we, you know, Police Scotland knew that this was the provision that, that was going, you know, in the bill, they're aware of that. Um, I think it is workable, but I think they, you know, having that they've raised, you know, concerns with this, this does allow us, we've got time now, we can go back, we can continue to work with them to make sure that, that we get this right. My view is that this is the proportionate response. Um, and so I, 
I hope that Parliament will agree with that. But um, you know, it's over to the committee now to decide whether um, the government's view is that this, you know, does tread the line of, of being responding to the, the issue to meet the objective in the, the least intrusive way possible. Thank you. Okay, th thanks very much. I think I just um, can't resist the temptation, I suppose, to come in on this point. I mean, I know, obviously, police, um, police Scotland have provisions within. Um, legislation around the likes of the carrying of offensive weapons where if you have a, re a, a lawful reason then that's fine or um, in the curtilage of a premises uh, if you're there for a, a lawful reason then th then that's fine um, and, and I just wonder if, if there is scope for this provision uh, bearing in mind I, I would agree with Russell Finlay's comments that probably police officers err on the side of caution if they are aware that there is a, a, a provision within a piece of legislation that the carriage of, say, a pyrotechnic can be done uh, lawfully, um, then my I would anticipate that they would, um, they would use that or invoke that legislation um, proportionately. So I would certainly be keen to, to perhaps see that, that provision maybe reconsidered again and explored a bit further. Thank you. Um, okay, um, that's I, just coming. No, no, so, come back sorry, on that. no, no, yes, no. Of course. Um, I, I think um, I was just going to say. I mean, absolutely, we take on board the points, um, and we're certainly not uh, trying to apply that. You know, uh, police can't use their common sense. Absolutely, they do it every day in in making judgment calls and so forth. I think the key thing for us, though, is. Um, it's, it's the issue of proportionality to, to the evidence that we have. And we have, you know, we did previously say that if there's more evidence available, of course, we would consider additional evidence. Um, and, I, I, and obviously, you have the evidence that is available to us. So if you feel that our response is not, is not the, 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 the proportionate one, then obviously it's, it's, it's up, up to you um, to be able to say that. Um, but I think that's, that's really been the key driver for the, the key thing for us in terms of is having this uh, uh, response that is proportionate to the evidence that we have available to us. Of course, of course. Thank you. Um, Jamie Green, are you wanting to just finally come was, in? That's just, just 11 o'clock now. So, it was just on um, this, yeah. So, um, Minister, you said that the, the, the government is trying to introduce legislation which responds to a public health situation. Um, but ultimately, it's the police who will enforce the legislation that the Parliament passes. And the police, in their subsequent supplementary follow-up to this, have been very clear that they would like to see the bill amended mm -hmm. to include a simple possession offence. Mm -hmm. Given that it's, it's, it is they, not us or the government, who will have to enforce the law, mm -hmm. yep. um, can you see why we'd be minded to support them on that? Yes, I mean, we greatly value the input from Police Scotland, um, from the Police Federation on, on these matters. You know, they've played an important role um, in developing this legislation. Um, the evidence that we have received from Police Scotland is that, that this provision that we have, as it is drafted, is workable. But um, as we've said, we are um, happy to listen to the views of the committee on whether they think it, it strikes the appropriate balance in this case. I think we've got one very final question. Um, I'll bring in Pauline McNeill and then we'll bring the session to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to, I wanted to be clear in my own mind about um, how the scheme and ho how the legislation works. So there's 37 days in which you'd be allowed to set off fireworks. Now, does that mean that the other days then, is that an offence? If you set fireworks off in your back garden, you're saying yes to that. Um, we did have evidence last week where uh, someone representing the retail trade, I think Jamie Green referred to earlier, was talking about... Um, there's a growing, uh, growing desire to set fireworks off for gender reveals, for mm -hmm. big birthdays, the whatever. Uh, personally, it fills me with dread, to be honest, because um, I do support the government's viewpoint that we need a culture change that setting off fireworks every day of the year does cause a nuisance. Yeah. Um, but you're clear that there would be a police reporting matter if your neighbour set off fireworks out with the 37 days that's a reportable offence. I just want to be clear about that. It would be, yes. And, are you con and you would expect the police to act against an individual if they did so? Obviously, enforcement is, is a matter for our operational uh -huh. partners. Um, but, yes, I think the key with this is to make sure the public are aware of what they're allowed to do and, and what they're not allowed to do, and with a view to, as you say, create the culture change so that we can, people are quite clear that they're not allowed to set them off at, at those times. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.
Okay, I'm going to um, bring the session to a, a, a close. Uh, we did have um, some more questions around the impact of the UK Internal Market Act and also some of the financial issues and delegated powers, but um, we will uh, we'll write to the Minister uh, and, and ask for uh, a written response to those uh, questions. So, uh, can I thank uh, the Minister and her team uh, for joining us uh, this morning? Uh, and we'll just take a short break and move before we move into private session, just to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you very much.